Namaste from Boston. This is Kanchan Banerjee. I'm a co-founder of the Boston Center of Excellence and also currently serving as the managing director. Welcome to our uh, webinar. We have been conducting this in this uh, uh, crisis time so that we all can get some advice and guidance from integrative health point of view, from yoga, Ayurveda, and mindfulness. And this is our fourth one in this series. Um, there will be many more coming up in near future. And uh, um, I think about uh, oh, around 200 people have registered from uh, about 30 countries. Thank you so much for joining us. And we know uh, we all are concerned uh, about uh, what's going on and we are all together in it. And uh, we will learn from the experts. Um, today we have two very distinguished um, guests and we'll come to them soon. A few words about um, our uh, center. The Boston Center of Excellence um, is, uh, uh, is for health and human development. We started four years ago and the idea was to bring together researchers, subject matter experts, practitioners, institutions, and supporters to foster research, program development, education, training, and promotion of yoga and Ayurveda. The center aims to improve disease outcomes by making yoga and Ayurveda co-constituent of integrative health and medicine in the US. Um, and before I uh, hand it over, I introduce our uh, guest today. I just wanted to mention that um, next week, we're going to have a very uh, different yet a very special session. This has to do with uh, creative arts. And uh, those of you who are interested, hopefully will join. And uh, we have uh, three distinguished um, artists who are um, well-known painters, and they're going to not only show their work, but also show how to do painting as well. So with that, let me um, go back and introduce our first uh, uh, speaker, Dr. Khalsa. And, uh, there we go. And let me quickly introduce him. Uh, Dr. Khalsa, uh, PhD, is a director of yoga research for the Yoga Alliance and Kundalini <clears throat> uh, Research Institute. And he's also an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He has conducted scientific yoga research since um, as far as, as 2001 on yoga um, for insomnia, stress, anxiety disorders, and workplace and school settings, and is practitioner and instructor of Kundalini Yoga as taught by his guru, Yogi Bhajan. He coordinates the annual symposium on um, yoga research. He's the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Yoga Therapy, medical editor of Harvard Report, Introduction to Yoga, and chief editor of the medical textbook, which is very uh, popular and widely used, called The Principles and Practice of Yoga in Healthcare. So with that, um, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Khalsa, um, and I'm going to make you the presenter so you can share your, um, your, your screen as well. Um, so give us a second. Um, did you get it? Not yet. Okay, I will. I'm making you the presenter, so you should get a message that. Uh, so, presenter to see. Okay. Now you should okay. be all set. Yes, I see it. Yes. Good. So thank and you. you Let us welcome now. that also. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Kanchan, for that uh, introduction. Uh, so what I want to share with you today is uh, what we understand about the biomedical science and research behind yoga. Uh, and we're also going to talk a little bit about its relevance, especially uh, in a pandemic like we're experiencing right now. But before we start talking about the science and research, um, we should really start with a definition of what we mean by yoga, because there's a lot of people practicing yoga. In fact, 14% of the US population is practicing yoga. 
However, many, many people are practicing just asanas and postures, um, the ones that you see here in this slide. Um, and that is yoga certainly, but um, traditional yoga actually incorporates different uh, multiple components. Uh, another component is the breathing exercises or the pranayama, very important part of yoga. The most powerful one is the long, slow, deep breathing uh, and the most commonly used. Uh, deep relaxation is another important part of the yoga practice, especially at the end of yoga classes. We do a supine relaxation called Shavasana. And then meditation is a critical part of traditional yoga practices. In fact, scholars and academics could make an argument that meditation is really the core component of yoga. The physical components are there really to support that meditative component of yoga practice. So the purposes of my presentation, we're really talking about this multi-component practice of yoga as, as what yoga is. Now, um, this really is a logic model, and this logic model summarizes what we know about the underlying science and psychophysiology uh, of yoga practices, how yoga works on the mind and on the body. So uh, in the top box, we have our definition of what yoga is with the components that I'm discussing, postures, breathing, relaxation, meditation. These are the ones that are mostly uh, studied and mostly the ones that you will get in a yoga class. There are other elements of what we might call a yoga lifestyle um, that go beyond these four elements. So for example, people will uh, adopt certain um, ethical lifestyle measures. People will adopt a yogic diet. Uh, people can live in a yoga community, et cetera, et cetera. But we're going to talk about this as our yoga practice. So all, of four, all four of these uh, components of yoga actually lead to improvements in the physical body. So I'm calling this improvements in fitness. Um, as you could have seen from those images of yoga practices, they enhance flexibility. Uh, there's a lot of isometric exercises which improve strength. There's balancing exercises and movements which improve coordination and balance. And, be, and in addition to the exercises, the physical, the breathing techniques, both of them together will actually improve respiratory function. Now through the mind-body connection, that improvement in bodily function actually leads to improvement in mental state through that mind-body connection. Also through all of four of these practices, we are engaging and enhancing what we call self-regulation. And what that means is that we develop the ability to control our internal state, both our physical, physiological, mechanisms and, and functions, and also our psychological, emotional, cognitive functions. Now, the most important ones that make the biggest difference are uh, improvements in, in our response to stress and our management of stress and our uh, management and response to our own emotions. So this is emotion and stress regulation. And this happens immediately. In fact, these uh, improvements in, in the stress system can happen just over a few minutes of practice. It's what's called the relaxation response. It's the exact opposite of the fight or flight response or the stress response. Now, as you practice these techniques over time, you develop a skill, you start to make changes in the body and in the nervous system, and you develop a resilience to stress and equanimity in the face of ups and downs of emotions. So that sub ability to self-regulate the body leads to a good deal of self-efficacy. You are now more in control of what's going on mentally and physically. Now, it's largely through the meditative component that we are controlling the attention networks. When you meditate, very simply defined, you're focusing your attention. You're engaging the attention networks in the brain. In yoga, often we focus on a single target, such as the breath or a mantra or a candle or something like that, but you can also focus your attention on the flow of thought itself or the flow of sensation. This practice of focusing your attention in the meditative act ultimately uh, leads to improvement in your ability to control and regulate the attention networks in the brain. That leads to an improvement in what we call mind-body awareness. It's also known as mindfulness ability to be much more aware and sensitive to what's going on both psychologically and physically. Now, the psychological improvements lead to improvements in cognition and concentration, ultimately, and to brain functioning. And as you focus your attention in meditation, there's an alternation between your successful focus and mind wandering, which tends to interrupt a meditation session. And you alternate between these two. Uh, you start to meditate, you focus your attention, and then after uh, 10, 15 seconds or so, suddenly you're thinking thoughts, and there's a chain of thoughts, and then you remember, and you bring your attention back. And that's what happens in the act of meditation, is this, this cycle of uh, focus and then mind wandering. As you 
practice the focus phase of meditation more and more, you become better at it. Uh, in fact, you start to become more quick at returning to the focus and you, you're able to stay into the focus phase longer. Ultimately, you over time, you develop a different relationship with your own thought processes and you develop what we call metacognition. And the basis behind metacognition is the reality that you have thoughts, but you are not your thoughts. Um, and that means that you now have the ability to react differently to your thoughts, to react at a different time to your thoughts, or even to change the, con uh, the content of thought processes. This is very powerful because uh, this is the same construct that underlies the most uh, universally used form of psychotherapy today, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is extremely effective. Um, and that metacognition then applies uh, to improvements that you get in meditation practice uh, alone or within uh, a yoga practice. So this is a very powerful aspect uh, of the benefits uh, of yoga. Now, as people practice over um, months and years, typically, people start during the meditation component, they start having what we call contemplative experiences. It's a sense of unity, a sense of oneness. Uh, it's a unitive state, which sometimes has a, a sense of transcendence, a flow state. And th those very powerful experiences can lead people into a deep transformation and actually a change globally in life, meaning, and purpose. So this is a much deeper experience. Now, one thing you can see from this logic model is we're making changes from the gross level, from connective tissue and muscle, all the way to the most uh, deep experiences that humans can have uh, and everything in between. So as a consequence, we're seeing changes in what we would call global human functionality on the gross level, physical and mental health and performance, and deeper levels, stress and emotion regulation, improvements in awareness and mindfulness, and this powerful state of metacognition. And then over time, many people will report uh, improvements in positive behavior, well-being, values, life purpose, and meaning, and what we're calling uh, more or less pure spirituality. Um, now, as you look at this logic model, what you can immediately see is the benefits of all of these different things on different um, uh, aspects of your life. So for example, if you are in a workplace uh, and it's a stressful workplace, you have stress and emotion regulation. If you're a student uh, in a school setting, um, school and students are undergoing a lot of stress, that would manifest for them, but they're also looking to import, uh, improve their academic function. Uh, so awareness, improvements in mind, body awareness and mindfulness will improve cognition and then ultimately grades. So um, you can see these benefits across a variety of different life circumstances. And certainly you can immediately start looking at benefits um, for something like a pandemic that we're experiencing right now. Give you one very subtle example. Uh, if you're increasing your mind, body awareness and your mindfulness, and you're trying to maintain a hygiene level, um, that improvement in your ability to maintain mindfulness is going to mean that you're going to be more thorough and more uh, exact in your ability to wash your hands more regularly, to maintain the distance, and to follow the hygienic um, uh, infection controls uh, that we have in place. Now, um, Another area that um, all of these benefits immediately apply to are multiple different medical conditions. And uh, we've, met, we've published this book called The Principles and Practice of Yoga and Healthcare. It's an edited medical textbook, which means there's 60 contributors, all of them leading yoga researchers around the world. And there's chapters on yoga for a variety of different conditions. Uh, and this is written in bio modern biomedical language by scientists for other scientists and medical professionals. And it's really our face to modern medicine, if you will. It's taking those benefits to yoga and making it relevant to the modern healthcare system. Now, in terms of the COVID epidemic, one of the biggest things that's going on right now, of course, is the stress of this. Uh, and stress leads to a multitude of different mood disturbances, including things like anxiety and depression. And one of the things that yoga is very good at from our logic model, and the research really supports this, is the ability to increase uh, management of stress. And so this is a recent review paper just published this year. Um, and, uh, and yoga appears to be a very good uh, management for stress based upon the research studies that have been done. Uh, in fact, I can make the argument that virtually every study that's used a yoga intervention and me measured perceived stress has shown positive improvement. It is that robust and reliable. Furthermore, stress management is one of the major reasons why people come to yoga classes. Almost 80% of people are coming to yoga because they've heard that it's very good for stress. Not only can we see improvements in the psychological perception of stress, 
we actually have many papers that have looked at objective measures of stress. Um, these are very strong measures that that, um, uh, that that we can look at in the body, things like the stress hormone cortisol, uh, systolic blood pressure, resting heart rate, heart rate variability, blood glucose, uh, and even body lipids. And we can see the improvements in that. Uh, and the conclusion from this review paper was that yoga provides an improved regulation of the sympathetic nervous system and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system, the two branches of our stress response system. And just to show you a couple of examples, uh, we've recently conducted a study of Harvard uh, medical physicians at Brigham and Women's Hospital. We delivered six weeks of uh, a Kripalu-based yoga program called RISE uh, at the hospital uh, to these very stressed uh, doctors. And what we found is that after six weeks, we had reductions in perceived stress that were maintained two months after long-term follow-up. And scores on a resilience to stress scale, we showed significant improvements at the end of the uh, intervention, uh, which were maintained at the long-term follow-up. Um, that, of course, uh, you would expect to also see improvements in mood disturbance, and anxiety is one of the uh, factors that, that uh, many uh, medical professionals are facing this day, and we saw significant reductions in our scores uh, on anxiety, which are also maintained at the long-term follow-up. Now, one of the consequences of chronic stress is actually its effects on the immune system. There's now a field of research called psychoneuroimmunology. And what is uh, the basic premise behind psychoneuroimmunology is that psychological state has a very real impact on immune function. In fact, chronic stress and strong em negative emotions like anger, uh, depression, and anxiety will actually impair immune function. You can see that from this review paper in 2018. Uh, and just to point out here, this is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis affecting negative impact on the immune system and the sympathetic nervous system also a negative impact on immune function. So this is a very real phenomenon. So anything you can do to reduce levels of stress will allow immune functioning to come back to normal. So this is very important in a, in a COVID environment where there is a lot of anxiety and stress. And if you can then uh, cope with that anxiety and stress more effectively, your immune system is gonna be in a better position uh, to resist any kind of infectious disease. And just to, uh, to show you some of the research that, that's now supporting this, there's a recent review published just a couple of years ago um, that looked at 15 RCTs, randomized controlled trials, showing improvements uh, in a number of measures of, uh, of immune function and inflammation. Uh, and just to give you a couple of concrete studies, this was a study that was done uh, with a yoga intervention uh, in young, healthy individuals. And what they found was that after the yoga intervention in the dark bars here, the levels of the stress hormone cortisol and the stress hormone adrenaline, um, the yoga group in the black bar is increasing, uh, or the control group is increasing, whereas the yoga group is maintaining their own. Uh, and in adrenaline, uh, the yoga group was re reducing its levels of adrenaline. The control group had no changes in adrenaline. So there's your evidence that the yoga is improving stress management. And then tied to that are two immune markers, IL-12 and IFN gamma. And what you can see is that the yoga intervention in the black bar is, is increasing statistically um, the levels of both of those immune mm -hmm. markers. Now, another study that's shown improvements in immune function is a study that was done in very stressed individuals, dementia caregivers, and they gave them a yoga meditation called Kirtan Kriya. And what they found was that Kirtan Kriya suppresses expression of inflammation-related genes and upregulation of expression of genes involved in antiviral and immunoglobulin responses. In other words, the genes, our DNA that's responsible for uh, maintaining immune function is actually enhanced. We can actually see the genes increasing their activity in terms of supporting immune function. So this is evidence for the improvement uh, of immune function at the molecular level. Now, another thing that, that's very important, especially uh, in terms of immune function, is sleep. Sleep has very strong impact on immune function, and that is evident when you deprive yourself of sleep. Uh, and even as short as a few nights of sleep, you will impair immune function. And what we know about uh, sleep is that yoga reduces stress, which is also supportive of sleep. And there are a number of studies that have shown that meditative movement practices like yoga, tai chi, and meditation uh, are improving qualities and depth of sleep. 
Uh, and in fact, what we can see is some of the evidence. So this is a study looking at long-term yoga practitioners, and they compared them with people that don't practice yoga. And what you can see on the sleep disturbance score is that the sleep disturbance score in the control group at 4.25 is much higher than that in the yoga group at 2.92. So yoga people that practice yoga regularly sleep a little better. Uh, and that's also reflected in long-term yoga practitioners' experience of um, their changes with sleep. In terms of answering the question, my sleep is better because of yoga, uh, almost 70% of long-term yoga practitioners agree or strongly agree with that statement. They actually attribute the improvements of sleep uh, to their yoga practice. And um, this is the evidence. Um, this review paper summarizes the evidence of sleep deprivation uh, on immune function. Um, and what you can see here is that it's mediated again through um, the stress uh, response systems and ultimately it leads to uh, changes uh, that can lead to risk factors for infectious disease, which what we're dealing with with COVID, uh, and then also improvements in, in uh, chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, cancer, and major depressive disorder. So it really makes sense um, uh, to, first of all, um, you know, practice yoga to improve the quality of sleep, but also that mind-body awareness, that, that perception of your sleep deprivation is important to encourage you to get enough sleep. And when we're talking about proper sleep, we're talking about seven to eight hours of sleep. And just to show you some real-world evidence, this is a recent study that was published that was looked at military trainees in the UK during their training period. And they looked at the number of upper respiratory tract infections during their training period that were related to how long they slept. So those individuals that slept between six and nine hours only had um, six, um, uh, an average of six upper respiratory tract infections. Whereas those people that were sleeping less than six hours a night had over 20, a substantial increase. So this suggests that this impact of uh, sleep deprivation on immune function is really, really strong. So uh, I'm acknowledging my supporters, which is the International Association of Yoga Therapists, which works to um, uh, apply yoga to a number of different medical uh, health conditions. And I work with them as their, internet, as their editor of their International Journal of Yoga Therapy. And I also comport, uh, coordinate the International Symposium on Yoga Research. I'm also funded by the Kripala Yoga Center, which supported that research on their program for physicians. And I'm also the research director for the Yoga Alliance. And in that role, I'm doing what I'm doing in this particular talk, which is sharing what we know about the science behind how yoga works. Um, and what we've done uh, is we've put up a number of citations on the free access website uh, under the About Us link on the Yoga Alliance. And you can then uh, look for citations um, that take you to the abstract or the full text of papers that uh, support all of the things we've been talking about in that logic model about how yoga works. And I'm also um, a research director for the Kundalini Research Institute, um, which supports the style of yoga I practice. So thank you very much uh, for your attendance. And I will now uh, turn it back to um, Kanchan. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khalsa, for your in-depth scientific um, presentation. And I'm sure people are going to learn a lot about the science of yoga. Uh, from those, it's a short presentation. Um, uh, Dr. Khalsa is knowledgeable about many subjects, not just uh, re uh, relating to um, sleep and uh, stress, but uh, uh, his website, uh, can you please mention your website once more? Um, is it yogaalliance.org? It is, I think it's yogaalliance.org. It's not hard. If you if you punch in Yoga Alliance in Google, it probably will be the first hit. And then we have uh, in the about section, there is research on yoga and that's where you can get access to all the citations. And we have actually now, we've got now videos that are coming online um uh, talking about uh you know the research in different areas and we will have a we, there will be upcoming fairly soon a video on yoga for immune function yoga for stress uh, and yoga for sleep great thank you so much again uh please hold on to your questions um actually not you can start sending the questions now so we will collect and after the presentation by our next guest. Um, we will take the questions and share between them and try to answer those. 
Um, so please uh, uh, start sending your questions if you have anything specific. Don't send long comments or long questions. It will be hard to uh, actually <laughs> read and respond. So send specific short questions um, or suggestions if you have any. So with mm -hmm. that, I will now turn the video on to um, um, uh, our uh, other uh, presenter today, Dr. Shalini Bal. And I'm going to briefly introduce uh, Dr. Shalini. Can you please uh, turn your video on so we can see you? There we go. Welcome, mm -hmm. yeah, Dr. Bell. Yes. Um, so let me quickly introduce her. Uh, uh, Dr. Shalini Val, a PhD, is an advocate of mindfulness in business, higher education, and society at large. Um, as a founder of Know Your Mind, that's an organization she has started, knowyourmind.com, I believe. Uh, she is committed to integrate the transformative potential of mindfulness in education, business, and policy to revitalize classrooms, organizations, and even communities. She has a um, doctoral degree in um, marketing uh, from the Eisenberg School of Management at UMass Amherst. And <coughs> she's right there right now. Um, she has been practicing mindfulness for over 15 years and received professional certification to teach mindfulness from the Center for Mindfulness at UMass Medical School and the Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute. And uh, for her and for Dr. Khalsa, you can look up online also, but you'll find a lot more details and I, I want to save the time for actual presentation. And uh, you may have uh, you, many of you have already responded to your poll. Dr. Val, uh, you uh, had a question that how many of you are multitasking right now? Guess mm -hmm. what the answer is? Um, so last poll was 33% yes, and the re rest was no. So 33% <laughs> people were multitasking as this session is going on. So let us welcome Dr. Val. Um, thank you, and I'm making you the presenter so you can share your um, screen. Uh, so give a second, uh, and I will also vanish myself, and so you can take over from there. Thank you. Um, can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay, excellent. So um, before we even begin, we um, ask that question. How many of you are multitasking? And the reason I'm um, asking, starting with that question, is because today is about multi, uh, about mindfulness, and this is an opportunity to, throughout the webinar, to look at how our default mind is going to want to uh, multitask, check our phones, check our emails, and so forth. And you know, and it's mindfulness is not about just being focused on one thing at one time, um, but it's about having that choice. So every time you feel like you're, uh, you want to multitask, go check your phone, just take, pause there and see if that's the most important thing for you right now. So let's do that as an experiment uh, where every time through this rest of the 20 minutes, you feel like multitasking, check in, pause, and see what is most important to you right now, and then they choose intentionally. So we have very ancient teachings from the Ashtavakra Gita, which is uh, an ancient Hindu scripture on the Advaita philosophy, which says, you are what you think. And and we also know from Buddha's teachings where he said, all experience is preceded by the mind, led by the mind, and made by our mind. So let's just pause here for a moment and, and let me ask you this. Your mind is your most valuable asset. Yes, some of our best decisions arise from this mind, and our worst decisions also originate from the same mind. And yet, 
how much time do we spend looking at our minds? So I don't know how many of you have a practice already, but even if you don't have a mindfulness or a yoga practice, how much time in our day do we spend turning our attention inwards to really look at um, what are my thoughts? Uh, what are my mental habits? What's going on internally, right? How much time do we spend doing that? So we, we take more care of our computers than our minds, yes? So uh, if you were to run our computers endlessly, right? Never shut it down. And we had multiple browsers open like I have right now, What's gonna to happen to our computer? It hangs, it slows down, right? And if you don't turn it off, it shuts down, it freezes. So the same thing happens to our minds as well when we don't stop. And I don't know right now, maybe this is something like your mind might be looking, oh, you know, where the one person's asking the other, what the hell is that? And he's like, oh, just my mind. And that's become the norm where our minds are so busy and they are uh, just full of stuff. So before we start today, I thought we would do a one minute reset. So as we're doing the reset, I just want to ask uh, Kanchan, is my video um, showing? And do I need to be, I do I need to change screen. anything? And we mm -hmm. see your screen, but uh, I'm not sure about the video. Okay, so would you want me to do that? To show my screen and my video or just? No, please do. No, you do uh, whatever um, best. Okay, so let's just continue, I suppose. We can just continue. Okay, so we'll do a one minute reset where I invite everyone to just sit comfortably. And we're gonna use this opportunity to turn our attention inwards. So um, if you like, you can lower or close your eyes. It generally helps me when uh, my eyes are lowered so I'm less distracted. And just becoming aware of the fact that you're breathing. If you like, we can start with a few deep breaths in. And as you exhale, slowly allowing your shoulders to drop back and down. And then returning to your normal breathing. Just noticing every in breath, every out breath, and even the spaces in between. Just for this one minute, no need to rush or get anywhere. Just inviting your mind to be here with your breath. And now turning your attention to your body, just checking in if there's any tension you're holding, maybe in your forehead and eyes, your shoulders and neck. the chest or abdomen. So breathing into those places where we hold tension. And as you exhale, softening as much as you can. And now turning your attention to your thoughts. Is there one thought or many thoughts? Can you be a witness to your thoughts? Just observing the thoughts coming and going in the vast sky-like quality of your mind. Just seeing these thoughts passing by like clouds.
And in a moment, I'm going to be ringing the bells to end this practice. So returning to your present moment, receiving the sound of these bells. So opening your eyes and what did you discover about your mind at this point? Did you notice that your mind was wandering? Like one minute it's here, even as you're listening right now, you may notice that one moment your mind is here listening and before you even know it, your mind has wandered away, yes? So we all have that in common, a mind wanders. And once you notice that your mind is wandering, how did you respond to that? Were you able to look at yourself with kindness, with an open mind, or were they judgments? Oh my God, my mind really is busy right now, or oh, I'm, so, I'm feeling so rushed, or this practice doesn't work for me, mindfulness is not for me. So did you notice any kind of judgments? And, and, and for those of you who are trying this for the first time, there might have been some sort of resistance, right? And trying something new can be hard. So th these are just some of the discoveries um, that we're going to look at today. So I just want to thank you all for taking the time to be here today. I want to thank Kanchan and his organization um, for inviting me here and, and Dr. Kalsa for sharing his knowledge about yoga. I learned so many things just listening to him. And what I'm hoping that we can do um, is learn a little bit about how our minds work. And the reason for that is the more we know how our minds work, the more control we have over it. And, and the second most important thing is the more we learn about our minds, we can extend compassion to ourselves. There's more kindness and compassion towards other people as well. So the second thing we're then looking at is what exactly is mindfulness and how can we use mindfulness especially during this time to reset for uh, for more calm and clarity. So we'll start with the first part, which is learning a little bit about our minds. So as we were doing that one minute reset, you might have noticed that our mind was not always focused in the present, yes? And so research shows that the mind wanders away from the task at hand 47% of the time. Question number two, what percentage of your daily decisions do you think you make unconsciously? So these could be the small decisions, like right now you might be choosing, oh, should I go and check my mail right now? Or uh, do I drink a, my I take a sip of my water or tea or coffee. It, the smallest of these decisions and the big decisions we're making right now about our own health or our work and our families. So what percentage of, do you, of decisions do you think you're making unconsciously? Boom, 95%. Yes, 95% of our daily decisions um, up to 95% can be made unconsciously. And the reason for that is be, that we have limited brain resources and the brain tries to automate everything so that we can be more efficient and save those resources for, uh, for emergencies. Let's look at the third thing we can learn about our minds. We're hardwired to resist change. So I'd like to invite you to try something right now with me. So if you extend your arms out and fold your arms in front of you, like this gentleman is doing in the picture, okay? And now unfold your arms, bring your arms out and fold your arms the other way around, the opposite of what you did. Okay, does that feel, did that feel hard? Does that, the second time, did that feel more uncomfortable or it required a little more effort to change? Maybe you noticed that. Yes, so we can see something as simple as folding our arms can become habitual 
and doing it differently can feel difficult. And, and now think about something like the coronavirus, which is totally disrupting our lives all around the world. So a change like that can totally trigger the fight, flight, or freeze response in us. So our brain does not distinguish between a tiger and any other threat. And as soon as it perceives that threat, we can go into fight, flight, or freeze. And let me try and explain that using this very simplified model of the brain, where the blue part is um, the neofrontal cortex, which is the thinking part of the brain, the executive decision-making part of the brain. And the red part here is the amygdala, which is an part of the emotional brain. And the job of the amygdala is to scan the environment for threats. And now when our brain is working well, the amygdala will notice the threat. Oh, okay, there is this virus and it's gonna send that information to the thinking part of the brain. And the thinking part is gonna then weigh the pros and cons and make decisions. Now, if the threat is greater than our capacity to deal with it or greater than we think we have the capacity to deal with it, there's something called the amygdala hijack, in which case the amygdala hijacks our thinking and that's what is known as a fight, flight or freeze. So we're not really thinking clearly. And this is when you have that immediate reaction or, you, or you know, you're in the store and you see people, everyone's rushing towards the, the toilet paper and you're like, oh my God, there's, there's no toilet paper. Let me go and attack and let me get some more toilet paper. Or, and generally this response is disproportionate emotional response. Very likely we, we're gonna regret it. And it's, it's been studied that when we have the amygdala hijack, our IQ drops by 10 to 20 points temporarily. So I'm sure you all have experienced the situation where we uh, something happens and we get triggered and then we immediately react without thinking and later we're like, oh my God, what was I thinking? So that can happen and it happens to all of us. So to explain all of this now, um, I've created something called the ABCs of the mind, and this really helps me to think about how my mind works. So let's take level A, where let's say there's an activating event, like we have right now, there's a pandemic. And so something happens, it could be in the external environment, like the pandemic, but it could even be a thought or a memory that you have, oh, uh, you know, or an email that you received or something. So there is something that can happen externally or internally, and it creates this immediate level B response, which it triggers your beliefs. So based on your past experiences, your conditioning, um, you will have an automatic reaction in your body. So, you know, think about when you read the news, and as soon as that information is received, your heart might start beating faster or your, it changes your breathing. So there's an immediate impact on our body. It affects our feeling tone. We immediately feel like, oh, this is pleasant, unpleasant. And it creates uh, a stream of thoughts. We're like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And so all of this at level B is happening automatically. Now, level C is where we have choice. So once we see that we have been triggered, I'm feeling anxiety or um, there is complete panic right now, C is where we can choose to either go into our default behavior, which very broadly has three categories, push, pull, or run in circles, or we can become mindful at that time. So let me go back to our default behavior. Very simply, we avoid, we push, we avoid what feels uncomfortable. So there's an aversion to any kind of discomfort, change, anything that changes a status quo, we don't like it, right? There's a resistance to it. And pulling is what we like. Anything that feels comfortable, pleasant, familiar, we want that. And the third tendency of the mind is to run in circles where we're rushing. Oh my God, I need to do, 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 I need to do something. Now that some, you know, all of this is happening. 
and we just keep rushing and running and repeating the same circles. So does that sound familiar? Okay, we don't have to act on default. The thing is we can learn to be mindful where we can invite these wholesome qualities of the mind that uh, of awareness, of really re reconnecting with our own sense of awareness, of compassion, um, bringing curiosity in that situation. Okay, what's really going on here? Let me take a step back to understand. And, and then even, even in the midst of difficulty, we can bring in a sense of appreciative joy or gratitude. We can bring in, invite in a calm, focus, and balance. And all of these wholesome qualities can be developed. So the question is, how do we develop these mindfulness qualities in a pandemic? So let's look at um, what is mindfulness. So I'm curious to know how many of you have, um, but uh, have done a practice, but I cannot see you, so that's fine. Um, let's see, what is the first thought that comes to mind when you think of the word mindfulness? Most people that I've presented before, they will think about meditation. So that's the first thing when people associate with mindfulness is meditation. But that's, as you may have guessed, no, mindfulness is more than meditation. So in a very, in a more humorous graphic over here, we can see that the human being and with the dog, the human being's mind is uh, even on a perfectly glorious day, his mind is full of thoughts and he's not able to enjoy what's in front of him. He's not able to see things clearly. So a very simple definition of mindfulness is seeing with clarity without getting lost in our associations and reactions. So Dr. let's Bob, just take a moment. Yes. Sorry. Do you want to um, send this second poll question out now? Uh, sure. Yeah, and let's just get a sense of how many people have done the mindfulness practice. So do you have a regular mindfulness practice? So we'll get the response. We'll give a few seconds. Yes. And I was thinking, let me see if I can get my webcam going. Stop sharing my webcam. No, I don't want to stop. No. So I was, yeah, I was just, oh. Share my webcam. No, hmm. don't change. Uh, we can see it. Okay. So All we right. we already have uh, sixty four percent people voted. Uh, Seventy six percent people said yes, and twenty four percent people said no. So that's a very good uh, response. So I'm closing the poll now so that you can continue. Excellent. That's great to know that many of you already have a mindfulness practice and. Um, and so a lot of what I will be sharing is familiar. And at the same time, um, mindfulness is about seeing things with an open mind and uh, having that childlike curiosity. So I encourage everyone to continue to have this childlike curiosity as you're paying attention. Um, with Dr. John kabat who I had the good fortune of learning from at UMass Medical School, and he offers this definition of mindfulness which is, it's the awareness that arises when we pay attention in a particular way. And that is, most importantly, that attention is accompanied with non-judgment. So what this is saying is that mindfulness is really about that awareness um, that we naturally have. It's already within us. But often we lose that connection with awareness because uh, focus is outside and we're so busy that we lose that connection with that internal compass and internal awareness. So how can we now reset for creating this deliberate calm, this calm where we really need it and want it and we can invite that deliberately and, and how to maintain a sense of clarity even in the midst of chaos. So, I like to think about it as two different ways that we can continue to cultivate these qualities of mindfulness. One is taking time to reset. So this is like that computer analogy where you're completely going offline. You're turning off your computer 
And whether it's going out for a walk in nature, whether it's sitting in your room and just being quiet. So you're really taking time out of your busy schedule to turn that attention inwards. The other is where we can learn to reset on the go. So that's kind of like a soft reset where we might just turn off a few of our browsers uh, on the computer and then just focus on what needs to be done. So let me explain that in a little more detail. So going back to the ABC model, um, if you remember where at level A and B, we can't really do anything much about it. Things are gonna happen in the world and that we can't control. B is our beliefs are gonna get automatically activated and your emotions, you're gonna have emotional. So if you're feeling anxious right now, please know it's okay. That's normal. In fact, that's what the brain is doing. It's helping you recognize that we need to take action. So we don't have much control over A and B and C is where we do have the choice to be mindful. And the way we can build those mindful qualities is through these three um, actions we can take, meditation, insight, and skillful action. So how we can reset with mindfulness includes all three of these aspects. Okay, let me just go back once more. So I think I really want to highlight over here is very often when people think that they have a mindfulness practice, they will do a meditation and, and then we jump back out back into our lives. So it's very important to remember that meditation is only the first step. So with meditation, we can calm the mind and then it creates an opportunity for us to look at our experience with that calmness and to explore the perspectives, explore our own beliefs, our intentions. And then from that clear seeing, from that right understanding about the situation is when we can then take actions, whether it's our thoughts, words, actions, we can be very intentional about them. So this is a model that was taken from uh, the original teachings of the Buddha uh, called the Satipatthana Sutra, which is the mindfulness discourse that the Buddha gave, in which he was very clear that, um, you know, in order to live with mindfulness, there are these three aspects of meditation, insight, wisdom, and skillful actions. And I was reading this article in, um, by McKinsey and Company recently, which really struck me because of the similarity of what they are proposing in today's world and to de decision making in pandemic. And they talked about the need to pause, categorically take a breath, and then assess, anticipate, and act. And it, it's really interesting to see that how even the management consulting companies right now are offering leaders this advice that if you want to make good decisions during this time, please make sure that you are pausing and, and taking that step back to see the big picture. So let's look at each of these um, three components of mindfulness <clears throat> or how we can develop. Meditation is really, a, it's a mental training basically so that we can learn about how our minds work. And by learning how our minds work, we can then regulate the different processes, right? Now there are two categories in meditation. One is concentration, where you're bringing your attention to a particular object. It could be your breath, it could be the mantras, a chance, it could be a candle, uh, it could be a body, walking, even walking could be a meditation. And the benefits of directing our attention to a single object is that it helps to calm down our limbic system, calm down in, um, our fight, or flight, uh, fight, flight, or freeze mode. And once we are calm, we are concentrated, we are able to focus on, on uh, what, what's important right now. So those are the benefits of concentration. The other meditation is of awareness where we are opening our awareness to our moment to moment experience. So rather than it being, it's kind of like the difference between flashlight, you go into a dark room and you uh, 
switch on a flashlight and you have this narrow window of what you're looking at and awareness is more like you turn on the headlights or the the light in the room and you're able to see more information and it's the ability to see the see your moment to moment experience in awareness without that reactivity and this awareness is what that allows us to cultivate insight and so when we create space once our mind is calm and we create this space we can then see what what's what's going on what is develop a right understanding so it could be you can question your own beliefs am i right like so if i'm feeling anxious i can question what are my beliefs right now uh, what is creating this anxiety and i mean just before we started today for example i couldn't find my headsets and so immediately i i, I jumped into my default mode was like you know oh my god i'm going to be late and and then my default action was to look in the jacket that i'm always wearing and it wasn't there so more panic and and so if i didn't take a moment to breathe i would have just said okay forget it i'll just work without the you know without the headset and then just by breathing i was able to look at what's going on and i remembered that i was wearing a different jacket yesterday and found the thing so just by creating a little more space with you know once you breathe you're calm and you create a little more space you can examine your beliefs your questions question your goals what is most important right now you know the, the other thing i'm noticing is our need to constantly look at the news or and so we can disrupt that pattern and say what is more important right now being with my family for dinner or focusing on my project right now what is important right now and aligning then your actions with your intentions the third part of insight is to look at consequences for everyone involved how is it who is this going to affect and how is it going to affect them and then based on that insight we can choose actions that promote well-being not just for us but for people who are affected by our decisions and doing that in the short term and the long term so very quickly that was uh, like i said there are two ways you can do this practice you can take out time every day to um, meditate and look at create insight for yourself discover your own patterns of behavior and figure out what is going to be most skillful for you during this time but you can also take this process on the go so um, an acronym that i've created for this is the reset is the first step is to just relax your mind you know before you're going for a meeting or a project or, or you're watching the news and you get triggered so take a moment to just relax your mind on your breath look at your experience with kindness and then step back to see the big picture you know what is going on what is important right now what is possible expand the possibilities instead of going by the either or look at what other possibilities are there and then take action so here are some examples of where you can use this process of reset in the morning instead of looking at your phone the first thing in the morning maybe you can start with a reset um, before you go for a meeting or decision making making time to go out for walks or doing some kind of body workout you can again turn your attention inwards during this time and then at the end of the day uh, taking time to reset so how many of you now going back to the first task or question we had how many of you are multitasking how many of you were able to actually observe yourself um, wanting to multitask and how many of you were able to then disrupt that multitasking behavior do we have a poll question here yeah so so your video is off so i'm going to do the poll now so please um respond to the poll question we'll give 30 seconds time and mm -hmm. the question is were you successful in the experiment noticing your desire to multitask and disrupting mm -hmm. by making a conscious choice so um the poll is on so please do respond we'll give you a few seconds and, yeah let's uh, see if, how everyone did in that so they're still going only 10 percent voted so far so give it a couple of more seconds okay 
And can, can people see my slide as well, or are they only yes. seeing the poll? Yes, to see your, your slide as well. Okay. Uh, so uh, oh. for those of you who have taken the poll, um, you know, just to summarize, you know, the three things you can remember is the first thing is you can meditate. Meditation can be just a single breath on the go, you know, just stopping during the day for deliberate calm and and then just checking in with the quality of your mind, your body, um, acknowledging what you're feeling with kindness. That's the first step. The second step is to gain insight to see clearly. And here is where you can do that very mindful, gentle inquiry of what is, what are my intentions? What am I missing? Uh, what's possible here? And then finally taking skillful actions. So the answer from the poll has come. Uh, 60% mm -hmm. voted so far, 85% said yes, and 15% said no. Excellent, good job. And for those of you who did not, the 15% of you, just check, note if you're judging yourself and uh, seeing again if you can part of the mindfulness practice is to keep coming back again and again to ourselves and acknowledging where we are and acknowledging our experience with kindness and then recommitting to you know whatever our intentions are we can keep aligning ourselves our minds our words our actions to our intentions for what we want during this time so um i'm your video your video is all uh, turned off somehow so can you please um oh, check that. is it turned off yeah uh -oh. like last few Oops. minutes okay i can go back um webcam there we go there we go we can see you oh all and right can, um it's can probably I... 12 or 4 and maybe um you can give some closing remarks and Right. I was just yeah, absolutely. So I was just going to share the slide. I don't think this is the slide showing or no. Yeah, oh, it is. Okay. okay. So I was just going to say that I have free Friday mindfulness sessions during this time at noon East Coast time. If anyone wants to join me, and there's a free mindfulness quiz on my website to see how you're doing on these eight qualities of the mind. Oops. And there are free meditations there on my website and you can also check out my research on mindfulness in marketing and public policy and i look forward to your questions thank and you and for please your mention, your, mention your website the url again yes um, so my website is actually know your mind um dot training training right okay yeah so it's know your mind dot training it's not know your mind dot com it's know your mind dot training great well, uh, Dr. Val, thank you so much for this wonderful uh, presentation. Um, we have learned a lot. I, I have learned so much uh, from this session and there are many questions coming. Before I uh, get to the questions, um, I just wanted to introduce uh, uh, our colleague, uh, Pramit Makode. Um, mm -hmm. so Pramit, can you please turn your video on? Um, so we yeah. don't see you. We cannot see you, unfortunately. It's showing the screen yeah. now. But uh, so um, Pramit uh, is also a co-founder of the Boston Center, and he also um, has uh, um, been working with Computer Society of India. They have uh, many many branches, and he heads uh, heads the um, <clears throat> American uh, uh, CSI. So can you please say a few words about the work you guys do? Sure. So, Namaste everyone. I'm Pramit Makode, one of the co-founders and director of Boston Center of Excellence. I'm also heading the Computer Society of India in North America. Uh, CSI is uh, one of the co-sponsors and partner for this global webinar. On behalf of both, uh, both C and CSI, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sadbir Khalsaji and Dr. Shalini Bayal for such a wonderful mm -hmm. and delightful session that has enriched our knowledge on this important topic. And Kanchanda, many thanks to you uh, for moderating this whole webinar and being so active in bringing the best mm -hmm. expert to this excellent platform. But before uh, we sign off, I would like to thank and briefly like to introduce uh, you to Computer Society of India. There are many members of CSI who have joined us uh, from different parts of the world. So Computer Society of India is the first and the largest body of computer professionals in India. It has started in 1965 uh, by few 
computer professional and now it has grown to be one of the most uh, vibrant international body representing computer professionals uh, main objective is to facilitate research knowledge sharing learning and career enhancement among all categories of it professionals uh, csi has 77 chapters in 77 different cities of india uh, we have 150000 members across the world although most of them are in india we also have 640 branches in multiple engineering colleges across india uh, CSI is actively working on so many digital India based initiatives started by the Honorable Prime Minister Modi ji and many of our CSI volunteers are very actively working helping IT professionals and students in this uh, during their times of need and in COVID-19 actively we are working with many many different city administrations and helping the professionals. Thanks Vincenda that was the brief yes. uh, introduction. Yes, no, thank, thank you so much, uh, Pramit. Uh, and we could not see you. Your somehow video is not working. Um, but maybe next time, before the end, you can try to fix your video. Um, we'll sh show your face to everybody later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, no, we don't see you. No. Um, mm -hmm. So something is not right. Um, so uh, no. I just wanted to um, have a disclaimer uh, because the first question has come uh, has to do with. Uh, therapy. Um, so BBC is doing these sessions uh, for information and knowledge um, purposes. We are not giving any medical advice to anybody. These are all, um, you know, additional things that you could do to enhance your, um, uh, your uh, physical and mental health. But um, if you have any issues, if you are having any health issues, please do consult your um, provider, healthcare provider, and also please follow the uh, regulations that are set up by uh, CDC uh, in, in the US and your local government uh, reg, uh, authorities. So please do follow that. Um, so with that disclaimer, I will go to the first question which has come for Dr. Khalsa. And the question is, um, and I'll read it out uh, completely. Um, if someone gets COVID-19, what yoga uh, and Ayurvedic arts mm -hmm. to be taken and change the lifestyle? So, um, you know, Dr. Khalsa, if you please uh, respond to that and maybe Dr. Val can also respond afterwards. So please. So, I mean, obviously we haven't had an opportunity to do any research on this. Obviously there is research on um, yoga for upper respiratory tract infections, which essentially coronaviruses are. So anything that would apply to an infectious disease would apply to, um, would apply to yoga's potential benefit. Now, I think um, the many different aspects of yoga all have important contributions to this. So keeping your body physically fit, long, slow, deep breathing, these have a direct impact on the body and would likely enhance immune function. Um, the deep relaxation or release of physical tension. Uh, the meditative component, as we've just seen, allows you to, to reduce perceived stress and then reduce the stress response, enhance immune function. In terms of specifics, we don't, we don't know which specifics. So for example, I can't tell you that breathing is more important mm. than meditation, which is less important than asana, for example. Uh, we don't have that information yet in, in the field of yoga research. Um, the field of yoga research is really in its infancy. The one thing that we are starting to see, however, is that yoga practices that are more than just asana tend to be more beneficial mm -hmm. for disease states than just asana alone. Uh, and that is obvious and somewhat makes sense because if you add meditation and breathing, you are adding components which by themselves have a positive impact in, in certainly physiology and, and certainly immune function. So um, that's the only recommendation is to, do, is to do all of the practices, do a full traditional yoga practice uh, rather than just asanas. But in terms of specific practices, which specific meditation, mm -hmm. different styles of yoga have made claims. So um, if you go to a certain school of yoga, they will say this particular asana, this particular meditation mm -hmm. is perfect for immune function. This will enhance immune function. Uh, and all of the different yoga styles and the different yoga masters have made these kinds of claims. 
Um, you can take them on faith, but certainly we have not reached the point in yoga research where we've been able to study individual practices like that and say, oh yes, this practice uh, works much better for immune function than a global yoga practice. So the safest mm -hmm. thing to do right now is to really do a global yoga practice. And that means regular. The more regular you are, the more often mm -hmm. you do it, the longer you do it, the more benefit you get. Um, so that's a, that's a dosing issue. And, and, and the more you practice, the better you, the better you benefit and the more your body changes and improves over time. So it's like riding a bicycle. The more you practice yoga, the better you become at inducing these, uh, changes in your body and, and, um, uh, nervous system functioning. And maybe could I add to that? Yes. Please. Um, so from a, yeah, so from a mindfulness perspective, again, we don't have research, but uh, just from what we know, um, you know, in addition to the how mindfulness can help with the stress reduction and building the immunity or support the immune system, I think one thing that I find and that's really helpful is that it it helps us look at our own defaults. So when we find that we're sick, that has already happened, and then, like I was saying, at level B, we're going to have some sort of anxiety about it and so forth, and that's also going to happen. And our default to that behavior is going to be like we're resisting it, we don't want it. And that tension that it creates in our mind and our body, I think, exasperates our suffering. So just from that perspective, the meditation aspect, you know, the yoga aspect, and then the meditation aspect is to calm the mind and to be able to look at what is our default in this moment and to soften that and see what is what can we control in this moment of time. So when we create that space, instead of just reacting, we can look at, okay, and, and instead of feeling hopeless, hopelessness because it's so overwhelming, just directing our attention to, okay, what can I do right now? What is one action I can take? So that also shifts from the brain perspective from hopelessness to hopefulness and sense of control. Thank you. And that question was from Deval Gupta, New Jersey. Uh, next one is a tough question. Bob Gilbo, I'm not sure from where, has asked this question. I think more towards uh, Dr. Val. How do I know how my actions will affect, benefit others? This feels mm -hmm. overwhelming. This feels? Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Like, yeah, to, overwhelming. To, you know, to analyze this. Mm. So again, how do I know how my actions will affect, benefit others? So, you know, we all have an inner wisdom based on our past experiences. And what we're doing with mindfulness is learning to, instead of going on that default. So if something happens and I, I think taking an example right now of changing our behaviors, you know, with respect to social dist physical distancing, for example, if we are being imposed that, um, that is being imposed on us and based on our past beliefs, if I'm young and I feel like I'm okay and I can do what I want, that's my training, that's my culture. So that's an automatic belief I have and there's nothing good or bad about that. That's just how I was born, how I was raised, right? And then the C part is now what we can learn is to stop, breathe and step back which is the metacognition part that Dr. Kalsa was talking about, we're able to see our own thoughts. And, and then we can see that what are, those are just my beliefs and I don't need to act on them automatically. And by creating that space, just through that breathing, through that calming, we create a little more space and we can, if you're not getting insight about, and we ask like, who's this gonna affect if I go out, um, you know, just my own friends were thinking of having a party and they were like, we'll be six feet apart and we'll be really conscious and we will not, uh, you know, so they were trying to be really safe about the party. But but the unintended question consequences could be that if there are other college students who are passing by and they see a party going on and they don't have the common sense to have the six feet distance or if they don't have the space for six feet, they're gonna just get the idea that it's okay to have a party. So that's where your actions can have unintended consequences. So what I'm suggesting is try these techniques, just a simple breathing or um, to stop, calm your mind and then open your mind to who's being affected, what are my beliefs, 
what are my intentions here? Just by asking these questions, you will be able to get more information based on which you can choose your actions. Hopefully that was helpful. A little long-winded, but hopefully that was helpful. Thank you. Dr. Kalsa, would you like to uh, respond or go to the next question? No, you can go to the next. Okay. So this is also a, a uh, tough one. Uh, <laughs> this is from uh, Victoria de Barbieri. Um, and she is asking, please address the issue of contemplative practices not being equal. And then she, she's explaining, is there not a difference in effect between insight versus attentional practices, that is self-compassion, gratitude, meditation, loving kindness, as opposed to mm -hmm. simply watching one's thoughts or observing the breath? Mm. So yes, there is a difference between um, attention practices, which, you know, where we're directing attention on a single object, whether it's your breath or a flame or a mantra, and they have, and the attentional practices have the benefits of calming the mind, relaxing, getting us more concentrated, focused on what's important. And it, this certainly has many benefits in its own place for stress reduction and, and so forth. Um, and once the mind is calm, if we then go into opening our awareness to, okay, noticing whatever's arising in our experience, what we're noticing internally and around us, without that reactivity, that's the insight meditation practice, which is once we've stabilized the mind, we open our awareness to cultivate the right understanding about our situation, to see how we are all interconnected so this actually also responds to the previous question that once we do calm down and really pay attention, we do start to see our interconnection and how we are, we are affecting each other, the causality, the causes and conditions. And all of this becomes more clear to us and it creates insight and then that can help us to, um, to take actions that, you know, that are more skillful, that promote well-being. Um, so I'm not sure if that's answering the person. Dr. Kalsa, did you want to add to that? Certainly there's there's different forms of meditation and different schools and styles and traditions. Um, two of the basic categories are so-called single point focus or concentrative focus, in that you tend to focus more along the lines of a single target, like the breath, a mantra, a word, a flame, something like that. And then there's so-called open focus uh, meditation in which the target of attention is wider. It's actually the flow of thought and flow of sensation. Um, and uh, there's also a loving kindness med meditation, which is more along the lines of a guided imagery practice, which is also essentially a mind-body practice. So the, but the answer to the question in general is that there are similarities, that they do produce similar benefits, but there are also very discrete differences. In fact, we know that there's differences because we've got neuroimaging studies that have compared some of these different styles and they show different effects in different regions of the brain. So there are very discrete differences. Um, we don't know the full range of all of the different benefits of the different types of meditation, but they do have subtle differences, but the commonalities are going to be the same. They're all going to induce this relaxation response. They're also going to be the opposite of the fight or flight response, reduce stress. They're going to increase mindfulness. That's because all of these things have in common the focus of attention and you're engaging the attention networks and the more you do that the more you become mindful and aware and the more you are inhibiting actually the limbic system and quieting the stress response system down so there's commonalities and and, and there are differences and what it boils down to really is personal choice what's your flavor what's you know do you like strawberry or do you like cherry um, and, and that is a big difference between individuals. Some people will practice one style of meditation and not like it and go to another style and say, wow, this is much better. Well, it's not, may not be better. It's just mm -hmm. more suited to your particular personality. So it's one thing I always recommend when people say, so, you know, what should I practice? What style of yoga should I practice? It's the same answer I would give to what style of meditation I should practice. And that is try them all, do some shopping, mm -hmm. find out what they are and then try them out. And then you will find mm -hmm. perfect practice that suits your particular personality and your particular, um, mm -hmm. you know, where you've been and, and, and how you've grown up mm -hmm. uh, state, both psychophysi psychophysiologically. 
Can I, t can I add to that? I was just thinking of this analogy. Is that okay, Kanchan, if I add? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so one analogy that was coming to mind is like, if you think of all these different qualities that these different practices are building of attention, meta-awareness, insight, compassion, all of these wholesome qualities of the mind that can allow us to navigate our lives, navigate this pandemic in a more um, insightful way. So these are all different qualities of the mind that we already have, right? We are born with compassion. We are born with the ability to focus and, and so forth. And so the analogy that was coming to mind was like going to a gym where we all have you know, we all have the basic muscles, but based on our past experiences, some muscles got more developed and some got weakened. And then we do different cross circuit training to build those different muscles so that we can then go outside of the gym and live with more agility. And I think I see that, in, um, you know, in my own practice is that sometimes I need more gratitude and appreciative joy. And so I will do a meditation that allows me to do to feel that. And sometimes I need more focus or sometimes I need equanimity. So depending on what is the quality of the mind that's most needed in, in addressing our problem, it's great to be exposed to different meditations for that reason also, so that you can choose what is important and uh, will be most supportive at this time for you. And, and piggybacking on this uh, response, uh, the next question came from DK Dubedi. Um, is asking um, is mindfulness and heartfulness same or different? So I mm -hmm. uh, mindfulness and heartfulness. Um, mm -hmm. I am not sure exactly what it means, but please do <laughs> if you can uh, address that. I would say it depends how you practice, and um, there can be a misconception that mindfulness is all about you know the mind and thoughts and thinking. And um, in, in the way that I've been taught, the idea is that by bringing awareness to our thoughts and body and experiences, we are able to learn to see things as they are and to connect with our basic wholesome qualities of compassion, goodness, and, and then take actions in, from that place. Um, sometimes it's easy to just do the meditations and and then it all becomes about self-awareness and just focusing on the mind and and it's easy to then forget about the compassion aspects of the practice which um, which then almost make it separate the mindfulness and the heartfulness but I think when we do mindfulness in 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 a way that we are once we are quiet and we're really allowing that insight to cultivate, we do see that we are interconnected, how my actions affect you. And that I think automatically brings that aspect of um, heartfulness or compassion in that. So I see them as working together because you can't be aware without the compassion. Um, you know, when I'm really aware, I can see we're interconnected and the compassion naturally arises. And and I can't be compassionate without being aware of what are your needs, what are my needs. So I feel like they work together. Thank you, Dr. Khalsa. Um, so mindfulness in in research has now become a very fairly well defined construct. Uh, we have quite a few instruments that actually measure mindfulness, and some of the studies have revealed that there are sort of five psychological facets to mindfulness. One is the ability to observe, the ability to describe to act with awareness, to be non-judgmental, and to be non-reactive. And those are sort of facets of the mindfulness state. Um, so that is what we talk about. And at, at its core, it really is the whole idea of coming from the focus of attention. Uh, in terms of heartfulness, that's not a term that has <laughs> a real definition psychologically. It's, it's, it's certainly a commonly used term in the general public, but in terms of what it means, it, it can be interpreted multiple ways. So obviously one aspect of heartfulness is compassion, uh, compassion and kindness. Um, that could be considered uh, one way of heartfulness. Another, an example could be, uh, you know, the, the phrase, put your heart into it. So that could be dedication um, and involvement and passion. Uh, 
Um, mm -hmm. So heartfulness is a, is a much more difficult term because it, it really hasn't been defined as a psychological construct of the same degree that mindfulness has. Thank you. Uh, uh, Hi, Banerjee, who is also um, a board member of BOC. She's asking uh, this question. Um, is there any link between stress and depression, particularly this time of COVID-19 era? And then if there is a link, how do we deal with it and to manage uh, our lives? So the answer to that is very, very clear. Um, mm -hmm. Chronic stress is the major risk factor for the development of most psychological conditions. In fact, chronic stress is a factor in virtually every disease state. Uh, it gives you an example. If you are diagnosed with cancer, you're gonna have very high levels of chronic stress. Um, chronic stress is one of the major risk factors for the development of depression. In fact, according to the diagnostic criteria for evaluating a bona fide diagnosis of major depression, sleep disturbance is one of the characteristics that is evaluated. Mm -hmm. Is that critical and that uh, uh, stress is actually uh, the major risk factor for the development of, of uh, major depression? And most people don't understand that. People think of depression as being low and stress as being activating. Well, chronic stress mm -hmm. is overwhelming to the system. And you basically have a disturbed and abnormal stress response system. Many people who have major depression have an abnormal stress response. Uh, they're under responding to situations. And so it can go both mm -hmm. ways. Uh, so the stress system is very much disturbed and it's a major risk factor for the development uh, for depression. In terms of the answer, how do you cope with stress? Contemplative practices, mind-body practices. It's, it's practice, practice, practice. That's, th that's what it is. It's learning these skills. Um, and they fall on these, these, these same four elements. If you learn how to move your body, uh, if you learn how to breathe properly, if you learn how to relax your body, and if you learn how to self-regulate thought processes, um, those are mind-body practices mm -hmm. that have a very strong established record of being very effective in stress management. There are, in addition, in terms of stress management, sort of ergonomic um, considerations, but those are more sort of applied to a workplace. So for example, if you're chronically stressed at your job, you find a way to use a computer to reduce some of the workload, you can reduce stress. But in terms of COVID, there's nothing you can do. I mean, this is, this is, mm -hmm. it's like a war situation, you know, there's no, there's nothing you can do to change the stressor or modify mm -hmm. the input. All you can do is change your reactivity and your management of the circumstance. Mm -hmm. And that is self-regulation of stress which means a mind-body practice. Thank you, Dr. Val. Um, I think one, one thing that I would add that I found very helpful with the people I work with is helping them see the distinction between their sensory mind and the thinking mind. So there are two neural networks that allow us to experience our worlds. And one is our thinking mind, which is the parts of the brain that are used for thinking, remembering, um, you know, making decisions, willpower, and we use that part of the mind all the time, yes? Uh, the other part is there's a sensory uh, perceptual network, which basically is using our senses of touch, of smell, of taste. And, and we, th through those senses, we're able to experience, experience the present moment. Now, these two neural uh, networks are said to be mutually exclusive, and you can try that as an experiment. So when you're sipping your coffee, try to really taste the coffee or tea and also try to calculate a number or something in your mind. And you'll find that we can't do both at the same time. And so one way that I find many people really find it helpful to switch off their anxiety and that overactive uh, emotional part of the brain is by switching to the sensing part of the mind, the sensory mind. And so like really tasting something or really smelling, or especially now with nature, uh, with springtime, really f f smelling the, or hearing the birds singing. So just switching to a sensing mind can really help uh, calm down that thinking and overactive um, thinking network. And that can be very helpful with anxiety. That was great. Um, you know, I'm going to try that today. Uh, itself. Um, a question uh, many people are asking us uh, thousands and millions of children and students they are home now and mm. they at all ages you know from kindergarten to college uh, 
and they're home and many of them are really stressed out and i know there are, is a range of ages uh, depends on you know what age group they are any general recommendation of do's and don'ts while they're staying uh, if you have any well just from the yoga perspective um yoga is very inter-individual and, and applies differently to different ages. So you can't give a regular yoga class to a two-year-old. It's not going to work. Right. Yeah. Uh, but there is a lot of instruction for virtually every age. Uh, and there are trained instructors who are able to teach yoga uh, to different ages. My wife, for example, teaches to preschoolers. Uh, and you can imagine that the yoga that they're doing is very, very different than the yoga that you would get in a public adult yoga class. I mean, these kids are basically just learning very simple mind-body awareness, um, very simple calming techniques um, that that they can calm themselves down. Now, the problem with, with our pandemic is that you can't go to a yoga class, you can't go to a kid's yoga mm -hmm. class, but there are right. a lot of online opportunities, and there are many, 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 many books uh, on yoga for adolescents, on yoga for uh, you know younger teens, yoga for children, and yoga for toddlers. There's even yoga for babies. So um, there's plenty of resources on the internet to look at different types of yoga practices. And there's many videos online. And especially at this point in time, a lot of yoga organizations are offering free classes online. Um, and this is both to kids, adolescents, and children. And all you have to do is you know look at the Google God, and Google God will tell you. Um, yes. Where where these resources mm -hmm. are. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fal. Do uh, you have any? Yes, questions? absolutely. Um, I think uh, the first thing is for parents themselves to be mindful and be practicing these things because they are role models for kids, and kids learn not from what their parents tell them, but what their parents are doing. So I really encourage parents to have these practices and I have a lot of parents whose kids sit with them their pets sit with them cats and dogs and they all kind of you know can start the day with some sort of a ritual and you can make it up with your kids so rather than saying okay come on we're going to sit and breathe now it's like we can make it fun and playful uh, you know with spring opening out and you could find maybe spotting the new leaves you know or doing some activity out uh, in nature and which really gets the kids to be really present and uh, connected with the earth and the mud and you know and, and playing with their hands getting their hands dirty observing a rock observe you know finding a rock and really sensing it so you can use anything that's in your household um, to make it a part of a mindful exercise game um, and uh, and the third thing I was thinking is having some sort of a routine. You know, it's so easy. I know it's so, so hard, especially in the West where we don't have extended family or care caretakers, caregivers, um, that it's easy to give your iPad or phone to the kids to just keep them occupied. And really that is such a bad idea at this time. Uh, I know I know if you have to do it, maybe find something constructive, useful that kids can do on on their iPads and phones. But generally, just the habit of kids, you know, swiping and is really can be really harmful to their brains where they get addicted to um, excessive stimulation and inability to really focus. So try getting books maybe for them to read or uh, or maybe it's focus games that they can play on there. So being a little more intentional, even if you're going to give technology to kids, be more intentional about what sort of technology can you give that might be helpful to them. Great. Thank you. Um, we have reached, we have crossed actually 90 minutes. I, there are many more people are actually online um, till now and sending more questions. So unfortunately, we cannot take many more. I'll take one more. Um, this is uh, um, actually, I was going to ask this question myself, but uh, someone from India has asked this question. Um, in this uh, pandemic period, um, many of us are financially stressed. Many people do not have jobs. And uh, yet we have to somehow manage our finances. Um, any advice uh, um, that uh, you can give um, to any household, any anybody that, okay, uh, save money or whatever, um, you know, mindfulness practices uh, can be recommended um 
I think just it is a, first is acknowledging that this is a difficult time. So it's not about pretending this is not hard or suppressing our anxiety around money and safety, but it's really first starting with that, okay, this is a difficult time. And then, you know, taking a few breaths, doing a little bit of meditation to calm down that overreactive mind, which also we have tend to have a negativity bias, which means we're seeing the threats more than the opportunities. I'm not saying there are opportunities here, but our mind is gonna go more and it's gonna spin in circles like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? And now I'm gonna lose my job. And then, and we keep, keep stuck in that. So just to disrupt that cycle, take a few breaths, do a little yoga practice, move your body if you need to. And then once you feel centered, really open, okay, what are the opportunities here? You know, for me, which I normally teach in person, the opportunity was to Zoom and now here we are. Like, who would have thought? Like, we would not be here if this hadn't. So this was the opportunity in a difficult time where using Zoom, we are able to connect. And so similarly, I would say there are opportunities. Like, for example, in our town, our local chambers of commerce, our, uh, you know, the business organizations, our nonprofits, are doing work to find out where we can get loans, where we can get mortgages, where you know, or where we can get support. So try to make a list of, once you come, make a list of who can I reach to, who might have this information. So ask for help, reach out, uh, whether it's a friend, whether it's a, a nonprofit, uh, there are people right now who are willing to help and i know i'm seeing the kindness come up so much in, in our own community so reach out to people and and also try to see if there is an opportunity for your particular skills at this time you know you might have been doing a certain job in a certain organization and that's our default but now that you are in this situation is there somebody you can help or you know, work for, from your home, maybe it's tutoring kids who are at home and the parents don't have the homeschooling kids. So they're like, try to, once you open your mind, see if there are opportunities that that might be there that you were not noticing. Um, I will take the very last question came from Haimanti again. Um, it is for Dr. Carl Samoa. Um, how do you uh, take part in the studies that um, you do or um, going on right now? And um, how do you um, find out and enroll? Is there... well, yeah, we don't, we don't have any studies that are open to the general public um, at this point in time. You know, the, the, the studies we're doing here in, in, in Massachusetts are really targeted at specific businesses and organizations. So, uh, the Kapala Yoga Center makes an arrangement with with those uh, facilities, and then we conduct the research on it. So it's really very, very specific, and uh, and one really can't participate in the research unless it happens to be something that is uh, you have very, very unique circumstances uh, that qualify. Thank you. So um, I would really like to uh, thank both of you from bottom of my heart and on behalf of Boston Center of Excellence and CSI to give us this time and uh, we will be in touch and many people they do uh, like to be in touch with you um, and uh, you please do send email uh, you already know the websites of uh, both Dr. Khalsa and uh, Dr. Paul but if you have any specific questions uh, send it to info at the boce.org um, so we will forward the questions to our experts uh, many people are asking, um, I do ask, um, is the recording going to be available? Yes, of course, um, it is being recorded and it will be available on our uh, channel, uh, YouTube channel, which is B-O-C-E-C-H-A-N-N-E-L, B-O-C-E-C-H-A-N-N-E-L. Um, and then for many more um, events like this are planned already. Um, you can check our webs, our Facebook page, which is BOC, Boston Center of Excellence. Mm. We have a Facebook page and you can find the next events. But I just wanted to make, mention next two events that are happening. Uh, this coming Sunday, today we, normally we do it on Sundays, but uh, tomorrow being the Easter Sunday, we uh, wanted to do, we moved it to Saturday. Um, so the next Sunday uh, event is uh, relating to arts and painting. So hopefully many of you who have interest in art. So this is one of the activities we were thinking mm -hmm. that 
staying home, uh, something creative can be done. And then the following week, we have a cardiologist in Tennessee, Dr. Indonil Basure. He's in the front line in this uh, COVID-19 um, situation. He's dealing with patients every day. So uh, he also uh, um, promotes meditation and uh, mindfulness. So he will be speaking from a doctor's perspective um, two weeks from uh, tomorrow. So hopefully some of you will be able to join. So it's all on the Facebook uh, page. So with that, I just wanted to uh, say thank you to everybody who participated from around the world. And I see, mm -hmm. people, I see people from uh, Australia. I see people from India. They're still up. And thank you for, uh, for joining us. And uh, we will uh, see you on a Sunday if you are interested in the arts. And again, namaste mm -hmm. from Boston. And thank you and stay well, stay thank healthy. You. Yes, everyone, please be safe. Thank yes. you. Bye-bye.